All right, hopefully everyone can see that. Welcome, Professor John Lennox to Australia. Um, Thank you very much. I know it's a virtual trip, but we are delighted to have you being with us on this very, very uh, important occasion. I know the 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 mood out here is uh, very, very favourable in terms of having someone such as yourself uh, enlighten us on the issue of faith and science, and we'll come to that topic later. Uh, what I'd like to do, Professor Lennox, and um, what I will introduce you very shortly in a more formal sense, but what I'd like to do is ask one of our committee members to open up in prayer so that we can get onto the right footing as we go into the webinar and this very important topic. Graham, would you be able to open in prayer for us? Thank you. And then I'll do the formal introduction. Thank you, Graham. Certainly. Thanks, Greg. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather tonight to learn about and to discuss these important issues of science and faith. Please work through Professor Lennox as he speaks. We ask that you give him wisdom and clarity as, uh, as he articulates his message, enabling him to speak something to each of us, whatever our own level of understanding. Likewise, give us clear minds and an eagerness for learning. And most of all, help us to be equipped and emboldened with practical tools to lovingly advocate for truth, both amongst friends and in the public square. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Graham. Now, let me just formally introduce our, ourselves to you, please, uh, Professor Lennox. And from now on, I'm going to call you John, but I will call, come back to, to your formal introduction. I'm the executive, uh, New South Wales State Director, Family Voice, and I tend to co host the webinars. John, of course, is our New South Wales Chairman, and we have a National Governing Board member, Reverend Peter Robertson. So they are the people that will be your interviewees, uh, interviewers tonight. Uh, Professor Lennox, also, I'm very excited to announce that you are indeed Professor of Mathematics at Oxford University, but I'll expand on that in a moment. But I've just found out also that you've got some books coming out. And I'd like to alert our, our, um, our audience that uh, 2084, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity. That's a fascinating title in itself. And of course, that, that's available at the website or of course on your own website, johnlennox.org. But I have to tell you that, that one of my favorite books as I was studying uh, some ministry work was when I was handed a book called Where uh, uh, Can Science Explain Everything? And where is God in the coronavirus law? And these two books are, uh, are available at the moment and they make fascinating reading. But the one I wanted to alert you to was Seven Days That Divide the World. Now, I have to tell you, I'm not a mathematician. I can't even balance my checkbook. But that's a fascinating book and I love the, the mathematics and the, and, and, and the intrigue that goes with it. So I recommend that for anybody to read if they can because... I don't know how you did it, Professor, but that's an outstanding book and certainly uh, re reaffirmed my faith. So I learnt that to everybody and I'm hoping that uh, we'll make that available. But of course, your current book coming out will be available at the end of this year. Is that correct, Professor? The book is already available. It's already available. It's so been, I, will, I will send it to all our, all our supporters and have them look at that. All right, so what we'll do now is if I may, I'm going to introduce you formally just very quickly so that'll set the mood and I think it's important that everybody's aware of it. For those that don't know, John Lennox, Professor of Math Mathematics at Oxford University, is an internationally renowned speaker on the interface of science, philosophy and religion. He regularly teaches at many academic institutions, is senior fellow with the Trinity Forum and has written a series of books exploring the relationship between science and Christianity. Fascinating topic. One of the things that I've, I've learned about you, Professor, is that you debated Richard Dawkins on the God delusion in the University of Alabama back in 2007. And, and you have, uh, and on has science buried God? 
in the Oxford Museum of National History in 2008. He also debated Christopher Hitchens, which is, which is a really fascinating, I would have thought, on the new atheism, which was at the Edinburgh Festival in 2008. And finally, the question of is God great, Sanford University in 2010, as well as Peter Singer on the topic, is there a God? And that was in Melbourne in 2011, so that's fascinating. Now, for those that don't know, Professor Lennox is an MA uh, and has a Master of Arts in Bio ethics. Uh, he's an emeritus professor of mathematics in the University of Oxford, an emeritus, emeritus uh, fellow in mathematics and philosophy of science, Green Templeton College, and an associate fellow of the same business school. Well, one thing I must mention for everybody is, and I'll have this sent out to everybody that's registered, we are eagerly awaiting later this year for the new Pensmore documentary, Against the Tide featuring Kevin Sorbo and yourself, Professor, in a conversation about God, science, and the evidence for the truth of Christianity. I'm absolutely delighted that that's coming out because it's something very close to my heart. Professor, tonight's format will be, we're gonna ask you questions, you're gonna respond, uh, and we prefer that uh, we will sort of interview you, so we're going to jump around, but uh, please take the time to uh, answer the questions in your own way but i'd like to kick it off very quickly because john i've heard you you've debated most of the well-known cynics on the compat on the compatibility of religion and science your main opponent your main opponents have called themselves the four horsemen of the apocalypse and these people were a la richard dawkins christopher hitchens daniel danay and sam harris my question to you, Professor, to kick it off and then we'll hand over to the others is, John, is it harder to be a Christian than an atheist? <laughs> That's a very difficult one. It, it depends whether you mean from an intellectual point of view or a truth point of view. I myself, as a scientist, I feel that atheism actually is so seriously flawed that for me to think of being an atheist would be very difficult because it would just land me in so many contradictions because I think atheism is false. And therefore, I think the real question behind that is which of these worldviews is true? Now, the debate is about worldviews. That's the very important thing to grasp. It's not about science versus God. And it's very easy to see that that is the case because if you take the Nobel Prize for Physics, for instance, it um, was won some years ago by William Phillips, an American who's a Christian. And just two or three years ago, it was won by a Scotsman called Peter Higgs, who's an atheist. Now, it's quite clear that those men are not divided by their science. They both won the top prize, but they are divided by their worldview. And so I think the real issue here is to realize that there are brilliant people on both sides of the debate. And so what we need to ask is, does um, science point towards atheism or does it point towards uh, belief in God and Christianity? And I come down very firmly on the latter. Yep, I understand. So, so Dr. Well, Lennox, if I can, if I can jump in, I guess it, our culture today is uh, fond of setting up a dichotomy between God and science. Um, uh, and I, I guess, I guess, from your work, I know you argue against that. that that's not that's true. That's not true. And and I know you've said uh, on many occasions that it's really science uh, that requires the Christian worldview or the theistic worldview to, to to have its proper foundation. Can you elaborate that on that for us? Sure. Um, this sad myth that has spread throughout society that God competes with science rests on a whole series of misunderstandings, but. Mm. Uh, we can come to those in a minute. But to your precise question, the convergence, so to speak, between 
the scientific picture of things and the Christian uh, worldview is made clear from any historical investigation of the rise of modern science. And it has been noticed by, by many people that the pioneers, the brilliant pioneers, Galileo, Kepler, and uh, Newton, Clark Maxwell, Babbage, and so on, they were all believers in God. And C.S. Lewis, I think, formulated it best when he said men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. There's a, a very deep uh, consilience between the two. And Peter Harrison, who's one of your most brilliant historians of science there in Australia, uh, he has actually developed a, a narrower and very interesting thesis that one of the things that facilitated the rise of modern science was not simply the Christian worldview that there was a creator, but the way in which the reformers handled scripture by shifting away from an allegorical interpretation to looking to scripture to see what it said. And he points out in his brilliant book, I think it's called something like Protestantism and the Rise of Science, that the idea, particularly the turning point came with Kepler, instead of imposing on the universe what it had to be like, Aristotle's circles and all this kind of thing, why don't we go and look and see what it's like? So there's a very strong relationship between those two things that I find that many people are not aware of. I can well remember uh, many years ago in Siberia, where I was invited to give the very first lecture on these things in 75 years in the University of Novosibirsk at Akadim Gorodok. And I mentioned the fact that these people were believers. And there was a shocked silence. And I could see anger on the faces of the rather KGB looking front row. So I stopped because I don't like angry people in an audience. And I said, what's the matter? And one of them stood up, who was a professor, and he said, he said, why have we never been told that any of these people was a believer in God? Well, I said, that doesn't surprise you from the perspective of Marxist atheism. They were absolutely astonished to discover that Newton and so on believed in God. So I think this is a very important legacy of Christianity. In fact, I very often say that I'm not ashamed to be both a scientist and a Christian believer because arguably uh, Christianity gave me my subject. So uh, that's the way I'd approach that. A great deal of work has been done on this. And uh, Peter Harrison is one of the people in the forefront. I'm sorry we lost him from Oxford back to Australia, but there I understand it. So Dr. Lennox, uh, atheists might respond and, and say, oh, well, people like Kepler and Newton, they were products of their time and their Christianity was, was a product of the culture that they were in. And I guess, why do you, why do you um, contend that, the, that their Christian worldview was fundamental to their science? Um, why, why, why can't you do science without that fundamental, or why can't well, you do science consistently with a fundament, with that, unless you have that Christian worldview? Oh, well, of course you can do science. Um, I've just told you about atheists who won the Nobel Prize, mm. but what we're talking about is the origin of science, and that's mm. slightly different, of modern science. And of course, that's the objection you raise is the obvious one. In, in fact, Richard Dawkins threw it at me. Mm. But the point is, you say, they were products of the culture of their time. Yes, they were, but it wasn't the only culture at the time. The Chinese culture was very present at the time. And the very interesting thing about that is that research was done by a very famous chemist and sinologist who uh, worked at Cambridge, I think. And he was very concerned to explain why the Chinese didn't develop any concept of abstract science. They did a lot of technology, fireworks, um, all kinds of hydraulic engineering and so on, but never abstract science. 
Now this man was a new, was a Marxist in his opinions, and he tried to resolve it using Marxist philosophy, and he couldn't. And in the end, he admitted that the only difference he could see between the Chinese and the Western thinkers was that the Chinese lacked the unifying concept of a single creator who created the world intelligently to run on certain fixed laws. So there you can see it from the opposite direction. The Christian culture did deliver, whereas the um, culture that didn't have this unifying concept of a creator did not deliver. So that gives you a bit of evidence in the opposite direction. So I, I think when you say something is a product of the culture, that of course, doesn't say anything about the truth and falsity of the conclusions they come to. <laughs> and <Sure. laughs> therefore, I would say that, uh, yes, of course, they were a product of a culture, but the culture was the one that led them in the right direction. Alternative culture didn't at the same time. Can I, can I come with a question there, uh, Professor, uh, to follow on from John? Um, and that is simply the question really, given that there seems to be misconception about what science is in public debate, particularly when people use science as a cover all for a total worldview uh, of itself, uh, that is out of empirical method, you can have a total worldview, um, which I think very quickly starts to uh, have some problems. But what, what, how do you therefore define what actually science is? Because I don't think people are talking about the same thing in public debate quite often. And therefore, what does modern science and empirical method owe to the Bible and the Christian faith? Perhaps is the nub of my question. Well, this question is, in fact, a central question for the, for the contemporary debate. What is science? Well, nobody actually can define science properly. It's very interesting watching philosophers of science wrestle with this. What they now say, in a little bit more modesty than they were wont to earlier, is that we have certain ideas associated with science. That is setting up a hypothesis, testing it by experiment, checking to see whether the hypothesis uh, fits the experiments, and then revising the hypothesis and testing and retesting and so on. And that is what we call inductive science. We do all sorts of trials and we come to some sort of conclusion. But the idea of a dispassionate scientist who has got no uh, prejudice, no prior assumptions, that has gone a long time ago. So people are much more modest. And the danger, as you hinted at the beginning, is for that method, which has worked extremely well, and we're all grateful for it, we are using technology at this very moment, which would have been undreamed of just a few years ago, which is a product of science and technology. The danger is of the success of science and its spin-offs leading to the notion, which is very widespread at the moment, of scientism. That is that science is the only way to truth, that science can explain everything, as is the title of my book. And very prominent people held that view, like Stephen Hawking and Richard Dawkins and, and so on. And you hinted that it runs into trouble very rapidly. Indeed, it does. It runs into trouble at the very beginning, because the very concept or statement, science uh, leads us into all truth, uh, that statement is not a scientific statement, and therefore, if it's true, it's false. So the thing is self-defeating to start with. And I like the, the words of, of the late Nobel Prize winner, Sir Peter Medawar, who said, it's so easy to see that science is limited. It's brilliant, but it's limited in that it cannot answer the simple questions of a child. Where do I come from? Where am I going to? What is the meaning of life? And he pointed out just to literature, philosophy, and so on, that we must turn for answers to those questions. But there still is deeply wedded in our academic society today the notion that science deals with everything. Not only that, another serious feature of that is that science is coextensive with rationality. And if that were true, of course, it would 
close half the faculties in your universities. It would stop your brilliant historian, Edwin Judge, whose works I admire greatly, um, from functioning because history would be regarded as not a rational discipline. And that's just utterly absurd. So I believe we need to fight against this idea. And even the great scientists, I feel, had no difficulty seeing the limitations of science. Einstein once said, you could talk about the ethical foundations of science, but you cannot talk about the scientific, um, <clears throat> the scientific foundations of ethics. So there are real limits there. And we got to proceed carefully and then think science explains certain things very well, but if it doesn't answer the big questions of meaning and so on, then we have to look elsewhere for answers to those. And I think the final point on this is that helps us to see why it's futile to pit God as explanation against science's explanation. Because let's put it this way, God is the explanation for why there is a universe for science to explain. And not only that, the different kind of explanation, and I wish more people could see this, that I often give an illustration. Why is the water boiling? Well, because heat energy is passing through the base of the kettle, agitating the molecules of water and so on. That's why it's boiling. But another way of looking that, at that is to say it's boiling because I'd like a cup of tea. Now, that explanation doesn't conflict or even compete with the scientific explanation. It, it complements it. And I often formulate it simply this way. God no more competes with science as explanation then Henry Ford competes with the law of internal combustion as explanation for a motor car engine. They are different kinds of explanation. And I think at the heart of the issue is, and it's back to your question, what is science? Is the nature of explanation. And explanation doesn't simply come at the scientific level of how does this work or why does this thing go there? It comes at the level of what is the purpose of this? What is the meaning of this? It's much broader than uh, the more narrow scientific formulation. Professor, one quick question to supplement that. Um, I don't know if you've ever taught Sunday school, but children always ask one fundamental question. Who made God? <laughs> I'm getting men asking me the same question. Professor, a quick response to that, please. Well, the quick response is, <laughs> if, if you ask the question, who made God, then you think of God as made. And uh, you see, some gods are made. We call them idols, and most of us reject them. But the biblical claim is that God was not made. He is eternal. So if you ask who made an eternal God, that's a contradiction. That question is utterly meaningless. And therefore, going into it a bit more deeply, they, and again, I put this to many atheists, asking that question is, is in fact missing the point completely because you're now talking about created gods, who created God. Well, most of us reject them as idols. Your problem, therefore, is that you cannot conceive of anything eternal. But why is that uh, the case? For many centuries, people thought the universe was eternal. So going into it philosophically, which I wouldn't do for kids necessarily, it's asking, do the questions go back forever? Who made God? Who made the God that made the God? That All this kind of thing. Or do they stop? And I find they stop on both sides. For a Christian believer like myself, they, they stop with God. And asking who made God doesn't mean anything because God is eternal. He was not made. But the atheists also stop. You see, when Richard Dawkins put this question to me, by the way, I never expected to hear it from an Oxford professor. But there, as you say, adults ask it. I said, look, I answered it the way I've just done. But then I said, you know, that question can be asked of things that are made. 
and you believe that the universe created you. So let me ask you your own question. Who created your creator? I've waited many years and had no answer to that. <laughs> I'm Peter. Well, Dr. Lennox, if I could ask you um, about uh, the claim that uh, atheists either make explicitly or implicitly, which is that everything uh, around us, all, all the reality around us can be reduced to, to matter and energy, basically. Um, I mean, that's, that's what's often thought about. If I can't see it, smell it, taste it, or touch it, it doesn't exist. Um, and I wonder, I mean, how does that account, that view, for all the immaterial aspects of the universe that I'm sure atheists would uh, acknowledge exist? Things like the laws of nature, mathematics, ethics, language, information, human intelligence. Um, well, you've answered can those things be explained by, by um, matter and energy or reduced to matter and energy only? You've answered your own question. Of course it doesn't. And reductionism, this is what's known technically as ontological reductionism. I was taught quantum mechanics at Cambridge by Professor Sir John Polkinghorne, and he's constantly at pains to explain that if that reductionism is true, we could never know it because thought simply becomes the firing of synapses and therefore has no meaning whatsoever. So that view destroys meaning. Now, I know of quite a number of atheists that can see that. The most famous at the moment and the most powerful is Professor Tom Nagel of New York, who wrote a book called Mind and Cosmos, why the neo-Darwinian view of the universe is almost certainly false or something like that. And he points out that this kind of reductionism, since it destroys meaning, cannot possibly be true. And I meet many people who try to convince me that this is the case, but more serious people like Dennis Noble in, in Oxford, the father of systems biology, just points out that this uh, leads to utter meaninglessness. And you put your finger on a very important thing, and that is, um, to abstract slightly from it, we live in an information age, and information is not material, although it's frequently carried on material things. Mathematics is not material. Uh, beauty is not material, uh, uh, and so on. And therefore, living in an age where scientists are increasingly regarding information as a fundamental concept which is not reducible to material. Well, to me, that's the end of materialism, and therefore it is, by definition, the end of ontological reductionism forever. And so how do the atheists that you've uh, dealt with uh, respond to, to that, uh, obviously, very strong challenge? I mean, how do they explain all these immaterial realities that they would live day by day uh, acknowledging? Well, some... Uh, do not believe they really exist. Mm. Others believe they exist, uh, but uh, they have no, as I understand it, they've never given me a convincing space where to put them because it seems to me they point like nothing else does to the existence mm. of an immaterial reality. This touch, taste, see, uh, that is so trivially false. We can't touch, taste, or see atoms and, and mm. <laughs> you know, it, it just doesn't work. So I, I feel it's up to them to give me some convictions. But the point is, there's a whole web of ideas and arguments that just are so powerful the opposite direction. I hope this kind of extreme reductionist view is fading. But the difficulty is, if you are a convinced atheist, it's your only option. That's the problem. You, you can't get rid of the idea of a creator. Uh, you either believe in a creator God or you believe that mass energy or indeed, and now this is the ultimate absurdity, nothing has the power to create everything. Mm -hmm. So I never thought I'd live to see the competition, so to speak, between God and nothing, but there's where we are in, in contemporary physics. Mm -hmm. Uh, Professor, can I come at a question which uh, perhaps is still circling around this, this general area of uh, plausibility of a science-based, totally science-based explanation? 
but uh, quite intrigued, of course, by the history of the of um, an explanation of everything, uh, or a theory of everything. Um, yes, yes. Thinking of so Stephen Hawking and going back sure. quite some way, apparently, into the into the dim dark ages too, of people who were having a crack at this back in ancient Greece. Um, but uh, I, I'm just wondering if um, the quest. My question is that the quest for a theory of everything has been a significant feature of physics for more than a century. In fact, for much longer. For such a notion that a full unifying theory of matter and energy is possible, despite objections and obstacles, I understand that, that spin theory is unraveling, uh, dis um, arise from the assumption that science can be a sufficient basis for fully understanding our existence and purpose. Because it, so much energy has gone into, uh, Einstein did it, uh, Hawking's done it. Um, it, it. Surely with all that amazing brain power, could it be so fundamentally misplaced? As, as a final explanation? Well, uh, I'm no expert in these things, but I am delighted that Sir Roger Penrose has just won the Nobel Prize, a mathematician in the department at Oxford here, who worked with Stephen Hawking on black holes and so on. My own view is simply this. The attempt to unify in an all-embracing theory the, the, the four fundamental uh, forces of nature. It's not a theory of everything in any sense of that word. It's a combination of four fundamental forces and it really asks for research. You can see that it just sticks up like Everest and, and somebody wants to uh, climb it and that's a perfectly reasonable thing. But even if it is found and one day it may well be found, it's not a theory of everything. It, it, it doesn't mean that, that God disappears. It simply means that we might have more reverence for a God who created the universe with that immense amount of sophistication. So I don't see it in any way as a threat. I see it as something extremely interesting. And one of the great unresolved questions that Einstein couldn't do and Hawking couldn't do, it may never be done. But even if it is done, in the end, it'll only be mathematics and, and physics. It won't be talking about what Nobel Prize winner Richard Feynman called the meaning of it all. Professor, one quick question. Have you heard of Jordan Peterson? Indeed, I've heard of Jordan okay. Peterson. I have a quote for you. Mm -hmm. And the Canadian psychologist and commentator said recently, who would have the audacity to claim that they believed in God? Comment. <laughs> well, Jordan Peterson is a fascinating intellectual figure. And I must confess, I, I've derived a great deal of pleasure and interest in listening to him, especially in his talks in Genesis. Yeah. And he's one of those people that has moved so far along the path that I would almost say ought to be a theist. And um, I think he is sometimes given to quite extreme statements. But let's just backpedal slightly. I, I'm very interested, of course, in creation. And I was fascinated to watch. He's got a series of lectures on Genesis that are riveting watching. But talking about Genesis 1, he comes across the statement that God made man in his own image. Male and female, he made them. And he pauses and he said, you know, this is the cornerstone of civilization. And then he says, man, if we lose that, we've lost everything. And I think that that really resonated with me, the sheer importance of what is being said in Genesis. Now, it's interesting if you put that together with a quote <laughs> that you have just made. What I think Peterson is alerting people to in a very important way is the importance of what Genesis says, no matter from what aspect you approach it. And this is immensely useful, I find, in trying to point out to people, look, here we have, at least in the West, for centuries, had a a firm base for our ethics in the fact that we have infinite dignity because we're made in the image of God. If you destroy that, you've nothing to put in its place. So in that sense, 
I feel he's got a great deal to say. I, I was hoping to have a conversation with him, but it hasn't happened yet. He's been quite unwell, unfortunately. Okay. There is a question, one of, our, one of our viewers has a question, uh, does relate to this uh, from Polly. Um, is there a way to capitalize on someone thinking that they are really the opposite gender from what the physical hormones suggest? Surely strict science helps us. Well, I, I really, you come to a stage in life where you can't take on another field. And I'm going to be quite upfront on this. I, I'm in my mid to late seventies now. And all this kind of discussion, I find I would have to spend ages getting into it. So I don't claim any expertise, but I think science of course can help us, but I'm not going to go further than that. That is a, a discussion that needs to be engaged in by people who are professionally involved in that topic. Dr. Lennox, um, I wanted to ask you about uh, what you would say as Christians uh, who are seeking to uh, contend for the faith uh, and, or, or defend the faith uh, against uh, secular objections, uh, for example. Um, are there, how, how would you um, advocate that best be done? Um, Either, would you recommend particular approaches, particular arguments uh, in, in, in that uh, endeavour? Uh, are there particular pitfalls that uh, Christians should uh, uh, keep clear of? I guess one, one thing I want to ask on that subject is, do, do we bear the burden to positively prove the existence of God uh, in some fashion uh, to, to an atheist for, for them to be satisfied? Or, or really, is, is it enough to demonstrate that the atheist worldview is completely inconsistent um, with, with the world around them? If you could comment on that subject. I could, but you've asked about six questions there, and most of them are generic questions, and generic questions are almost impossible because we're not dealing with a particular individual. But let me make some comments uh, on, on that. When you use the word prove, of course, as a mathematician, I'm allergic to that being used incorrectly. Mm -hmm. And the word prove has at least two meanings, and they're very different. The one is the mathematical one, uh, starting with certain axioms, building up with agreed logic to a certain conclusion. You don't get that even in any of the natural sciences. But then there's the more ordinary use of the word, although they get very confused. And that is to give evidence for, to give pointers towards, to establish beyond reasonable doubt. Now we can certainly do that. And when it comes to commending the, the Christian worldview, I would say there are two major aspects. There's a subjective and an objective one. The subjective one is my experience of God, and that's immensely important as part of the evidence. The objective, and I'm using these terms loosely, is the various facts. And of course, it depends on, on where a person is. Uh, some people are so far back from understanding anything that they don't even know that there's strong evidence that Jesus existed. And a lot of that ignorance can be cured, can be uh, dealt with by dealing with facts. And if people won't listen to facts, then it shows that their problem lies elsewhere. But I'm going to say a couple more things. And, and the first is we need to learn to listen I was taught that I'd got one mouth and two ears, and it might be a good idea to use them in that proportion. And all of my life, uh, I have quite a public profile now, but it wasn't always the case. And what has fed the public dimension in my life is constantly listening to people, where they're coming from, why they believe what they believe. And therefore I say to folks, unfortunately, Many Christians are taught that they've got a message and they've got to deliver that message and they will deliver it in the same way no matter who they're talking to. And they've got one shot and that's the only opportunity they get because it puts people off. I think it's much more important to befriend people and to do it by using a Socratic method by asking questions. And I've got a little rule that I break partly because I'm Irish and impatient. And it's when I meet somebody new to keep asking them questions until they ask me one. 
you'd be amazed at how much you will learn about someone by doing that. Mm. Now, uh, this is a hugely important topic. Mm. The Apostle Peter says, always be ready to give an answer to those or a defense to those that ask you a reason, a logos concerning the hope that is within you. And it took me years to grasp that that was not talking about preaching. People ask you. In other words, it's talking about a conversation, one-to-one -one conversation. And I, I think that's what we should concentrate on. And often people get into despair, Christians, and they think I've got to read a dozen book on apologetics before I can do anything. I say, no, 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 no. Talk to your friends, ask them questions, find out what their difficulties are, and then you spend time privately getting answers to those questions that you can share with your friends. Those answers will stick with you all your life and they'll be real. Now, I've been asked your questions so many times, uh, John, that mm. I've written a little book about it, which you may not know. It's the cheapest book you'll ever buy. It's called <laughs> Have No Fear. Mm -hmm. Because behind your question is the fact that many people, they love to engage, but they're either afraid or ashamed. And my little book is absolutely practical from beginning to end, just to share with people the things that I have found over a lifetime that help me engage and help people to take the Christian message seriously. John, I have a question from a nine-year-old who's listening into the program tonight, obviously with his dad or mum. And the question is, do you think the Big Bang could have happened? Uh, well, thank you. I love people. I was once nine years old myself. <laughs> and I would ask questions like you. But let, let's think about it. What does big bang mean. Now, I knew a little bit the late Sir Fred Hoyle, who was a brilliant cosmologist. And he it was who talked about the big bang, but it was a joke because he didn't like the idea of a beginning. And in the 1960s, when I was younger, evidence came in for scientists and they started to think, goodness, there must have been a beginning. And it was a Catholic priest, Georges Lemaitre, who first, much earlier on, had this idea that there must have been a beginning in some kind of, well, what they call a singularity, a start. And it was that that Hoyle jokingly called the Big Bang. But it's just a label on a mystery, actually. And it's wonderful because it says there was a beginning. So science believes there was a beginning. Now, the Bible has been saying that for thousands of years. And I was once in a conference with some very famous people. And they, I talked about, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And they stopped me. There were quite some anger and said, Professor Lennox, you do not mean to tell us that the Bible is anything useful to say to us in the 21st century. I said, yes, it does. I wasn't joking at all. It does because you see, it says there was a beginning. Now, it was only in the 1960s that you scientists came to that conclusion. And let me make a suggestion to you. If you had taken the biblical worldview more seriously earlier than you did, you might just have looked for evidence for a beginning before you did. So you don't have to be afraid of Big Bang. That's what scientists call it, but they don't know exactly what it was, but they do know it was a beginning. And we can add to that, that the Bible says yes, and it was a beginning caused by God. Professor Lennox, um, the miracles of the Bible, um, uh, for example, uh, a question by atheists saying, well, how could the Bible be re uh, true and reliable uh, given uh, passages like Joshua 10, 13, where the, the sun and the moon stood still or, or, or Jonah obviously being uh, swallowed up uh, uh, by a large marine creature, um, etc., or obviously resurrections from the dead. Uh, you know, that's not very scientific. Um, uh, so we don't see that happening uh, today. Um, 
How do you uh, deal with those common objections to, to the, to well, the occurrence comes of miracles? Back to Peter, that comes back to Peter Robinson's uh, original comment. That is a, rests on a misunderstanding of what science can and cannot tell us. And all this objection to miracle, and of course I meet it a great deal, mm. goes back, for most of my colleagues, goes back to David Hume, uh, the Scottish Enlightenment philosopher who once wrote, miracles are violations of the laws of nature, and therefore essentially they cannot happen. But he misunderstood the situation. And just before he died, I was, not Hume died, but... <laughs> Uh, the philosopher Anthony Flew died, who was the world expert on David Hume. I had the opportunity to interview him. And he told me in great modesty and honesty that he'd been completely wrong about um, David Hume. Hume's objections to miracles do not work. They're fairly easily shown to be false, as I once said to Christopher Hitchens, and you can see it in my debate with him. But to come down to it, perhaps the easiest way of seeing it is to use an illustration due to C.S. Lewis. If I'm staying in Sydney in a hotel, which I've done several times, wonderful hotels with a view of the bridge, I must say, and I put $100 into my bedside drawer on the first night and another 100 the second night, I've got $200, you would think. But if on the third morning I wake up and find $50, what do I conclude? Do I conclude that the laws of arithmetic have been broken or the laws of Australia have been broken? Now, it's pretty obvious that the laws of Australia have been broken. How do I know they have been broken? Because the laws of arithmetic have not been broken. You see, one plus one equals two, yes, provided nobody interferes with the system. And my mistake was to think that my drawer in my room in the hotel was a closed system of cause and effect, which many people think the universe is. But it isn't. So a thief can put uh, their hand in and steal $150. The laws of arithmetic won't stop the thief. And the great confusion, and I could say a lot about this, but I have written about it in my book, Can Science Explain Everything? The <laughs> laws of nature are not causes. They are descriptions of what normally happens. Uh, the laws of Newton will tell you roughly the trajectory of a billiard ball, provided nobody lifts it from the table, but they can't prevent it doing that. So here's the irony of the whole thing. In order to recognize a miracle, you have to know the laws by which the universe runs. Otherwise, you'd never recognize it. Yeah. If uh, you didn't realize that dead people normally remain dead, you wouldn't be the slightest surprised at, at a resurrection. And Hume went on to say something even more absurd. He said, uh, belief in miracles arose in primitive times when people could easily believe them. But that isn't true. When... Um, Joseph discovered that Mary was pregnant and she talked about an angel. He simply didn't believe her because he knew exactly where babies came from. And it took very powerful evidence and convincing coming directly from God through an angel to convince him of what had actually happened. So those kind of objections I find uh, pretty trivial, but it needs to be teased out because people somehow feel that science disproves the kind of miracle in the New Testament. Now, I've added that phrase because, of course, there are lots of claims for miracle that aren't genuine at all. And we need to be pretty skeptical and examine the evidence because uh, as a scientist and I hope a thinker, I'm not prepared to just accept everybody's claim that a statue has been crying or something like this. But the New Testament miracles, the biblical miracles, they, they all fit into a pattern of a universe that is not a closed system of God, uh, of cause and effect. And God who designed the whole system and built into it its laws can, of course, 
feed a new event in. Let me make one final point. As Christians, as a Christian, I'm not claiming that Jesus rose from the dead by natural processes going on in the grave. No, I'm claiming that God raised him from the dead. That's a totally different matter. That is, there was an input, an injection of energy and power from outside an open system. And there's nothing in all of science that can prevent that. Science can tell us about the regularities, of course, and historical science, if I might call it that, investigation of past events that you can't repeat, can give us strong evidence that these events occurred on occasion. Professor, can I, uh, can I ask a question which takes us on to uh, a question about the Bible in more detail, or perhaps more generally, uh, in principle, um, particularly since Genesis 1 to 3 is such a focus of so much perhaps angst amongst Christians about <laughs> the questions of science and faith um and you are um a, a, apart from your, your your mathematics and your philosophy of science expertise you're also um um an, an excellent expositor of scripture to many people and i've been one of those up at katoomba uh here in the blue mountains where i am um what advice can you give how best to read genesis 1 to 3 for instance in the light of the variety of ways believers read these chapters now and have done so through history because the ways of reading or ways of doing hermeneutics have varied so enormously and we do have anxiety around how to read the text uh, while we're trying to debate these issues. Well the best advice I can give if you personify it is uh, the book that you advertised at the beginning which is my attempt to come to terms with all those various readings and to try to help people navigate a way through so they can make up their own minds. I don't wish to make up their minds for them. But I will mention, because that's a very unsatisfactory response, it's just asking people to read one of my books, which is uh, shameless advertising, in fact. But there is a strong reason behind it. It's a big question. It takes uh, quite a lot of thinking about. And the, the problem is, I think, partly, and this may surprise some people, that we don't take the Bible seriously enough. Now, let me take just one of the points, and that is the idea that puts many people off. They say science has shown that we live in an ancient universe, and the Bible seems to indicate it's very young. Now, that is deduced, and oddly enough, I make a confession here, my hometown is Armagh, and Armagh is the seat of the famous Archbishop Usher, who calculated that Adam was created in, I think, the 5th of October, 4004 BC, but more accurately, he couldn't place it, he, he wrote. But when we look at scripture, and I'm not a Hebrew expert, but I know several, and I can check with them. The very interesting thing is, if you look at that text, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is a statement that's followed by a sequence, the famous days. And each of those days begin with, and God said, and God said, and God said. Now, that is hugely important because it is encapsulated in the first sentence of the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word. And God said, this universe came to be through a series of speech acts, not through random unguided processes. Now that's saying a great deal and it's concentrating our minds on information. But that often gets lost in the fact that people say, ah, but uh, this was a short time ago. Well, I say just a moment. One of the interesting grammatical things about the text is Hebrew has two past tenses. And the opening statement in Genesis verses one and two is made in one past tense and the sequence of days in another past tense. And if you read Jack Collins's book, and Jack is one of the translators for the NIV, started off as a scientist and changed to be one of the world's experts in the Hebrew language. And the text of the Old Testament says that the opening statement of Genesis, and I'm paraphrasing, takes place at an indefinite period before the sequence of days. Mm 
Well, that ends it for me. The, the Bible says nothing about the age of the universe. And so a lot of this fighting has been to read into the Bible more than it says. Now, I don't want to read into it less than it says, but there's a huge danger in trying to protect Scripture by forcing it to say more than it says. And the irony of this is that no matter what you believe about the days, um, it doesn't insist on the universe or the earth being young. So that's the first thing. And what saddens me is to see Christians fighting about this kind of thing because it's observable that in the wide spectrum of Christian believers, you will find those who believe in the fundamental doctrines. That is, there is a creation. God is the creator on the deity of Christ, his life, death, resurrection, ascension, and so on. But they disagree on the understanding of Genesis 1. And that ought to warn us that the thing is not easy. And those disagreements were felt centuries ago, long before Darwin or anybody else appeared. And therefore, we need to show humility and realize that there is a real possibility for differences of, of opinion. That's how we learn. So I, I thought I would try to write something and give an illustration from past history as to how people accommodate what the Bible appears to be saying and what actually is the case. And you can, of course, read it in terms of a young earth. But my argument is you don't have to and you don't lose the authority of Scripture if you read it a different way. But we take hours to go into it. Professor, one quick question, and perhaps our last, because um, uh, time is getting on. Putting on your scientific hat, if life was found in another galaxy, how would that affect our faith? Well, it wouldn't affect mine, because uh, the Bible tells us there is life elsewhere. That sounds <laughs> you know, I... I Paul Davis, who used to be in Australia, who's a very well-known physicist, and I know uh, we were once, he, he wrote a book called Are We Alone? And um, he says, as a human, he hopes we're not alone, but as a scientist, he thinks the evidence is that we are alone. And of course, he was launching his book, so he was on the radio program first. And then I was asked what I thought uh, about extraterrestrial intelligence. And I said, there's one very big one. He's called God. And I, I think the fact that the Bible talks about intelligences like angels and spirits and demons would warn us that whatever we exist in, there's a material universe, but there are things beyond that. We need to be very careful before we um, make pronouncements. And anyway, how could it alter my, my faith in God? God hasn't told us everything. He's allowed us, thankfully, to explore his universe. He's told us in Scripture what we need to know about the meaning of it, but he hasn't told us anything, either plus or negative, about these other things, except a hint that the whole thing, whatever you want to call it, is vastly more sophisticated and complicated than not only than we imagine, but than we can imagine. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, we've come to our time, it's ending. Um, I have to say we are delighted to have you share your thoughts and faith with our um, listeners. Could I ask Graham to close in prayer and uh, then I'll bid everybody farewell for the night. Thank you, Graham. Certainly, thanks, Greg. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the opportunity tonight to discuss these most important matters and particularly for the opportunity to engage with Professor Lennox. We thank you for him and for the great gifts you have given him. Please encourage and strengthen him as he continues to engage in intellectual discourse in the increasingly hostile public arena, mm. continuing to give him both the wisdom to make effective arguments for truth and also the love required to win people's hearts through his conduct 
For the rest of us, Father, we pray that you'd help us to walk away from tonight with a refined understanding of the issues, some of which we've discussed being the danger of scientism, the nature of explanation and purpose, and uh, understanding the limits of science, to name a few. Please grant us opportunities to speak truth on such matters and the boldness required to stand firm when holding to truth becomes unfashionable and difficult. And most importantly, if we're to learn one thing from Professor Lennox, let it to be to speak the truth in love, to listen, to ask questions rather than lecture and berate. Like him, may we reflect Jesus in this way, and may a kind and gentle spirit of discussion be a defining characteristic of us all as Christians. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Professor. May you continue your, your good service in the public arena. We are so privileged to have you. Our thoughts and prayers are with you. Uh, this, will be re this has been recorded. We'll send you a copy. May I thank everybody that joined us tonight to pray for Professor Lennox as he continues his mission field. And may he also keep taking on the John uh, the Dawkins, the Richard Dawkins of this world, because really out there we need to stand up for what we believe in. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good night, and thank you, Professor, for joining us from all the way from London, UK. God bless you. Bye everybody. bye. Good night. Bye.